Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Heather Brown. I'm the Director of Grant Writing and Publications at the University of Missouri-Columbia. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fourth annual Federal Research Update webinar. This event is sponsored by the University of Missouri-Columbia, the National Association of College and University Business Officers, and the Florida High Tech Corridor Council, an economic development initiative of the State University System of Florida. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we begin, just again a note that um, we're sending out uh, good thoughts to all the folks who are affected by Hurricane Sandy, and a special thank you for all of our presenters who have been so flexible and were able to reschedule almost everybody um, that we had to cancel the first two days due to the hurricane. Um, as we get started today, please note that if you have any technology problems, issues, or questions, please send an email to federalupdate at missouri.edu. And you can also send any questions that you have for our presenters to that same email address, federalupdate at missouri.edu. Finally, we have viewers joining us from across the country, so we're going to use, instead of specific times, phrases such as top of the hour and bottom of the hour to indicate when speakers will be beginning. So, I am pleased to welcome back again Dr. Elizabeth Elbro. Dr. Elbro is currently Acting Commissioner of the National Center for Education Research, Institute of Education Sciences at the U.S. Department of Education. She received her doctorate in psychology from the University of Chicago and served on the child development and education faculty at Whittier College and on the psychology faculty at Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. She has spent the past decade overseeing research programs in the areas of reading and writing and cognitive science at the National Center for Education Research. Let's turn it over to Dr. Elbro. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I want to apologize here for folks who heard the earlier session. There will be a little bit of overlap, but I do have some new information in this set of slides, so I encourage you to stay for the whole presentation. And I do look forward to your questions at the end. So the focus of this presentation is really to talk about grant policies and procedures at the Institute of Education Sciences. <clears throat> and as part of that, I'll give a little bit of an overview about our current funding priorities so that everyone has a sense of where we sit around funding. So uh, just a quick overview for those of you who are not familiar with the organizational structure of the Institute of Education Sciences or what we do. We are the independent research arm of the U.S. Department of Education, and today I'm really only going to focus on the work that we support through the Institute of Education Sciences. The Department of Education, as you know, funds a wide range of programs and, and um, different research programs and different implementation of actual programs, and I'm not going to touch on that today. So, as you all know, we have a director who reports directly to the secretary, John Easton. He is advised by the National Board for Education Sciences, and we have an independent standards and review office which reviews grant applications as well as reports that come out of the institute that report directly to the director. And then we have our two research arms, the National Center for Education Research and the National Center for Special Education Research. What I will speak about today really reflects the research efforts supported through the two research offices. As many of you know, the Institute of Education Sciences was created through the Education Sciences Reform Act in 2002, and we are charged in that document with three real legislative, real tasks, right? So Congress has said, these are the things we want you to do. <clears throat> the first is to describe the condition and progress of education in the United States. This is primarily the function of the National Center for Education Sciences, and many of you are aware of things like the NAEP, the National Assessment of Education Progress, which really fulfills that mission. Our second mission is to identify education practices that improve academic achievement and access to education opportunities. This is really the primary driving focus of the work supported through the research efforts of the Institute of Education Sciences. We are really seeking to support research that allows us to both develop as well as identify and evaluate what works for whom and under what conditions in the context of um, our nation. And finally, we are also charged with evaluating the effectiveness of federal and other edu education programs. The vast majority of our evaluation dollars are, sit with the National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assist Assistance, and they are the ones charged with evaluating federal programs, federal funding streams, things like Title I funding, 21st century learning communities, or, for example, Reading First. <clears throat> 
For those of you who are interested in learning more about the National Board for Education Sciences, which provides, again, <coughs> advice, excuse me here, I'm going to need to get some water. This is what happens when you do two in a row. Um, the National Board for Education Sciences, if you're interested in seeing who the members are, what kinds of conversations are had, discussion of priorities, uh, I refer you to this page. There's actually a wealth of information here that might be of interest to some of you. <coughs> The director does have a set of priorities that guide the work that we fund, and I just want to draw your attention to, to sort of two pieces of his priorities that really do shape the research that we fund and, <clears throat> and really affect some of the policies and procedures that we have in place to support um, the relevance of the work that we're doing. So the first is that um, the director is really encouraging us to support research that is relevant to the work of education practitioners. So through our funding streams, we are working very hard to encourage researchers to develop these sorts of partnerships with different stakeholder groups. And as you'll see um, in the next few slides, we have programs that are specifically targeting work in those areas. But at the same time, the director is entirely committed to maintaining rigorous scientific standards for the technical quality of its research. So we want to ensure that the methods applied are appropriate to the questions asked and that the results obtained from those, that work is both valid and reliable. Uh, at the same time, he wants to underscore the fact that we support research that includes a variety of different research and statistical methods. What's the difference between the two research centers that we support? The main difference has to do with the population of learners that we are particularly focused on. So for the National Center of Ed Research, we fund research covering pre-kindergarten all the way up through adult education. And so we fund work across the, the range group, that age group rather, um, and we're really focused on supporting work particularly to improve the outcomes for at-risk learners. So one group across this population that we don't support is typical undergraduates, right? So if you're thinking about how do we support research in the area of undergraduate education outside of the work of students who are at, at um, who are challenged, if you will, who are at risk for dropping out or who are at risk for failure. Our post-secondary portfolio is relatively small compared to, say, NSF, which has a large undergraduate research portfolio. Uh, Nixer, on the other hand, the Special Ed Center, focuses primarily, or I shouldn't say primarily, but exclusively on research with uh, students who are in need of special education services. They also focus on work from birth all the way up through high school or when kids age out of receiving services through IDEA. <laughs> um, the President's budget request for 2013, this is again a repeat of the slide from beforehand, but I did want to just put it up here so folks can see where we are. The President actually requested an increase of $12.5 million over 2012 levels for our research development and dissemination line, which as you can see by the title includes more than just research funding. Um, but as part of that request, there is specific information um, and a specific request to enable the research center my research center, the National Center of Ed Research, to award up to $30 million in new R&D awards in early learning and elementary, secondary, and post-secondary ed. <clears throat> if that comes past, that will give us, put it, bring us back to uh, 2010 funding levels. Research in special education for both new and ongoing awards is actually flat, flat funded in the President's budget at $49.9 million. So just to recap here, what were the fiscal 2013 funding opportunities and what do we anticipate for 2014? Um, again, our timeline is a little off for the timing of this on my uh, annual Halloween uh, reporting out in terms of what we're doing. Our grant making timeline, we're actually just at the end of our initial reviews of our reviews of our initial submissions to our June deadline. So every year we have two deadlines, uh, one in June and one in September. In early March, our requests for applications are released, which has all the information and will have all the information about dates. Letters of intent for June are due in mid-April. Applications are due mid to late June, typically the third Thursday in June, historically. Our peer review meets in, a in late October. And then our awards are announced in early March, right? The initial, the first start date that you can ask for a June submission is March 1st. So we do our best to announce award as close to that initial start date as we can. It's, for applications submitted to September, you can see there's a similar, a similar timeline. 
for um, for folks in your offices who are interested in applying to IES for funding, I just want to reiterate here that the best way to find out about our current funding opportunities is to go to the ies.ed.gov backslash funding page as opposed to going from the ed.gov site. <clears throat> if you go to the ed.gov site, you're going to get different information or perhaps not as current information. <coughs> Cop away from the mic, that's the, one of the keys, right? So if you go to our page, you can see the funding opportunities are right there. What are some of the changes that we made in terms of policies and procedures, in terms of how we tried to improve the opportunities that are available for researchers out there? The first is that we made a concerted effort, both on our website in our, and in our request for applications, to implement fed, the federal plain language guidelines. So all of our fiscal 2013 requests for applica applications, as well as our grant submission guide, were revised following the plain language guidelines. If you're interested, there's actually a website. You can go and read all about what those guidelines are. <clears throat> we also changed our funding opportunities landing page following the same principles. The hope here was that we could be clearer about the expectations in our RFAs to make sure that researchers knew what was expected coming in, in terms of what needed to be included in your application, and what was going to be expected coming out, right? So <clears throat> when you put in a research application, you have a plan of work, and so it's helpful to think not only where are you starting, but where do you hope to go? And so we really tried to capture that in what we hope is clear language in the RFAs. <clears throat> We will continue to follow these principles for fiscal 2014 and are continuing to try to improve the language that we use. And so if anyone has any comments or feedback or suggestion, please do send that to me. We really do want to take into, uh, into account the input that you all have in terms of the, whether we've improved the RFAs, whether our plain language worked, whether we made it better or worse. <laughs> so please feel free to do that. So here's our funding opportunities landing page, and you can see we tried to really slim down the steps into five steps. We've got our little checklist on the right. We know checklists are important for everyone. Um, and really started, went through what we think is an appropriate process for most applicants. The first is to identify the right funding opportunity, right? So we have multiple funding opportunities that are available, and not all of them are appropriate for the work that you want to propose. Um, the second is to make sure you register for a webinar. So we do webinars um, starting in March, and we typically have a lot of webinars scheduled in March and April, and sometimes in May, and then we have webinars again uh, heavy in June and July, where we really provide detailed information for applicants around particular topic areas, research goals, or particular research competitions. So if you're not aware of that, please do make sure that you and your faculty are. Then you need to make sure you download three sets of information. So you need to download the RFA. The request for applications have all of the information about what needs to be included in the written, sort of the written narrative, the budget narrative, any appendices. All that information is included in the RFA. Our application submission guide, which is really about how do you fill in the information on the G5 package, right? So what goes in box 13? And if you have questions, really do start at the submission guide. It's, I think it's really helpful and it really does give you a step-by-step -step set of directions. And finally, you will need to download the application package. Just a reminder, uh, again, if you are an applicant or if you work with many applicants, <clears throat> make sure that you download the appropriate application package. Just a reminder, the application package for June and September deadlines, even for both of our primary competitions, they are actually different, although they look similar to you. There's a different code, and if you try to use the June application package to submit a September um, application, you will find that you are unable to do so. So please make sure you've got the right package that you've downloaded. We encourage everyone to submit letters of intent. Letters of intent are not binding, um, but they are incredibly helpful both for, for you as the applicant to get information to, to the appropriate program officer who can then reach out to you and begin a conversation about what you're proposing. It's also really important and really helpful for our standards and review office to make sure that they have the right reviewers on hand to review your application. <clears throat> and finally, submit your application to grants.gov, but before the deadline. And as I'm sure for those of you who are grants officers at institutions, this is, I'm preaching to the choir here, but we tell everyone, please make sure you get your applications in as soon as possible 
preferably two weeks ahead of the deadline so you have time to actually go into the system, see what got uploaded, make sure it wasn't the wrong CV that got uploaded or the wrong narrative, God forbid, or <clears throat> you forgot your response to the reviewers. So early is better in this case. All right, so just uh, what, what happened last year or what happened this year, it's hard for me to know what the right tense is since we're in the midst of fiscal 13. Here's what we competed for fiscal 13. Our primary programs of research are our education research grants and our special education research grants program. Again, for those of you who are not familiar with the CFDA number, 84 tells you that it came out of the Institute of Education Sciences. 305, the numbers right after the period, 305 tells you that it was out of the National Center for Education Research. 324 tells you that it's out of the National Center for Special Education Research. And then the alphabet letter at the end tells you which competition it is. <clears throat> so for fiscal 13, I guess the only thing I really want to draw your attention to here is that the Special Education Center competed this uh, competition called Accelerating the Academic Achievement of Students with Learning Disabilities Research in Initiative. We do not intend to recompete this in 2014, so that will not be an option. The others will maintain, although the last two in a somewhat different form that I'll tell you about in just a minute. So for 2014, we anticipate having our education research grants competition, our special education research grants competition, our program focused on statistical and research methodology in education, and we will have a new program. We intend to have a new program. Uh, we don't know what its letter is yet, uh, but it's called Partnerships and Collaborations Focused on Problems of Practice or Policy. And what we hope to do with this new competition is to pull together the Researcher Practitioner Partnerships in Education Research, our evaluation of state and local programs and policies, which are two programs that we competed in fiscal 13, and include a new topic called Continuous Improvement in Education Research. And I'll talk a little bit more, I believe, about that. Well, yeah, I, I'll come back to this in just a minute. I want to proceed. I'm pretty sure I have another slide that where we talk about this. Um, another new thing under our training programs for fiscal 13, we have our research training programs in the education sciences. We had a new topic this year focused on researcher and policymaker training. Um, and under special ed, there should have been a star there, but I, don't, I forgot to put it. On the early career development and mentoring program is actually a new program within special ed as well. For fiscal 14, we don't expect any changes in those two training programs. Um, I did mention uh, in the prior session that we are un engaged in conversations right now about whether we'll have sufficient funds to, uh, to open up our pre-doctoral training program for competition again and whether we'll have sufficient funds to award the postdoctoral training program in special ed. Uh, no decisions have been made as of yet, but stay tuned and in March or late February, we, you'll know. So a quick, a quick recap in terms of our programs, um, just a basic requirement, you know, this is this particular uh, slide, slideshow webinar is focused on policies and procedures. Here's a basic procedure that I want to reiterate, a basic policy. When you apply under the primary research competition, just know that each application must select one topic and one research goal. Right, so there's an intersection, there's 10 research topics in the NCER uh, RFA and five goals. So it's at the intersection of one of those topics and one of those goals that individuals should be writing their applications. <clears throat> These are the topics. A couple of things just to highlight in terms of things that changed in 2013 and that will continue to fund going, that will continue to be of interest going forward. Under education technology, for the first time, you can now um, propose to carry out some exploratory work under that goal. So if you're interested in technology and you want to carry out some exploratory work and learn maybe how education technology is being used in school settings and how's that, how that is related to student achievement, this could potentially be a place where you could apply. Um, the other important thing to note here is that under reading and writing, we are now accepting applications to develop new reading interventions under reading and writing, and that will continue going forward. Um, I think, I think, I guess the other thing that I didn't mention before that I, but what I do want to mention uh, now is that under the social and behavioral context for academic learning, there were two sort of new additions in terms of topic areas of focus. 
One was a fo focus on civic education, and I do want to encourage folks to look at the language there. Um, this was aligned with a department priority focused on civic education, and uh, we intend that language to continue. There was also some language uh, reflecting conversations that are happening happening at an interagency level, looking at ways to improve education outcomes for students in the juvenile justice system. And so if you're interested in questions of juvenile justice, I just think that might be of interest to you. All right, there's lots more, but I'll leave that open for you. Um, under special education research, again, I want to just draw your attention to the fact that there's a lot of similar research topics to what you just saw in the previous slide, but there are some specific topics really focused on uh, particular questions around special ed. So for example, if you're interested in doing work on the autism spectrum, we have a topic specifically focused on that. If you're interested in learning how best to serve families of children's with, children with disabilities, this would be a great place to look, right, our new families topic. All right, and our research goals, again, this is really just a quick overview for folks not familiar with our programs. We have five research goals. Uh, the first is exploration, where we support researchers who are uh, generating hypotheses about connections between aspects of the education system and malleable factors that might um, be able to be changed and improved to improve outcomes for kids. Development and innovation, where we're really focused on developing um, or revising current interventions, understood very broadly. Efficacy and replication, testing whether an intervention is working under relatively controlled circumstances. Our effectiveness goal, last year it was known as scale up, this year its effectiveness will be going forward because the real focus is to test whether in fact causal impacts shown in prior efficacy work maintain when they're delivered under situations of typical, um, typical practice. And finally, measurement. Measurement, I think every time I say this, I want to do a call out to psychometricians and folks who do measurement de development work out there. We have an awful lot of um, areas for which our measurement techniques are, how shall I say this, are less than strong, right? And there's lots of, lots of room for growth in the measurement area. And I want to encourage you, if you're interested in measurement or know ex have experts in that area, please do apply. Okay, other things to be aware of and just to take with you, policies and procedures. Okay, so here's a policy, right? Maximum awards were set for the first time in fiscal 13 for the, um, for the goals. So it used to be that we would provide a guidance. guidance. We would say that there was a range, right? A typical range, typical uh, number of years, typical amount of money. This year for the first year, we've had to put maximums in terms of the maximum amount of money that researchers can request including uh, both direct and indirect costs. So please do make sure that you are aware of those guidelines. I'm not expecting changes at this point to the maximum award amounts, but again, one for in terms of for fiscal 14, but since the fiscal 14 budget is, is really unclear at this point, I would hate to speculate too much along that. I can just say for sure there will be maximums and I wanna make sure that everyone looks at that information in the RFA. The other programs that I mentioned, um, and I, I, additional and other, it's not like these are less important somehow. I don't know, I don't have quite the right, the right frame. Other perhaps is better than additional. Let me talk a little bit about the researcher and policymaker training program. I wanna sort of tie this back to our real concern to make sure that we maintain the rigor of research that, that we fund and that we support and that we inc increase the relevance of the research that we've, we support. The hope is that these two, th this training program focused both on researchers and policymakers uh, will help us achieve that goal. So the first researcher training is really intended to provide support to researchers who have completed their, um, their official training, you've completed your doctorate, you've completed your postdoc, but you need additional training. Um, and the second is the policymaker training program really intended to share what, what we are learning as a field with policymakers. And so applicants were invited to submit under the, that topic if you have ideas about programs, training programs to create. That will continue into fiscal 14. The research training program in special education is really focused on early career development and mentoring. The purpose here is to provide new young investigators who are, I believe it's three years out of their, po of their training, their pre-doc training, um, maybe post-doc training, but it provides them with support and mentorship. And this is particularly for institutions who are at 
uh, perhaps a predominantly undergraduate research institution or an institution that doesn't have lots of support for research. It's really the hope here is to provide support for young scholars who need additional mentoring and support to continue on with their research. Stats and research methodology in education, I say this every year, but I'm going to say it again. Um, if you'd like to be the next uh, Steve Roudenbush and come up with a new way of handling nested education research, right, do hierarchical linear modeling, this is your RFA. If you've got some new way, perhaps thinking about maybe the use of data mining techniques in the context of all of this education data that's being connect collected through SLDS, right, the state longitudinal data system, you should, could, could consider putting in a proposal here. <clears throat> now let me just talk a little bit about the next two and, and I want to just let you know that the next two are going to be combined into this new RFA that I mentioned before. And the overarching purpose of this new RFA is really to pull together all of our research programs where there is a requirement that policymakers and practitioners are part of the application process. All right, so for the evaluation of state and local education programs and policies, we have a requirement that, uh, that the policy or program that's going to be implemented is being paid for and implemented by state or local education agencies, right? So the idea is you've got a state or a district, they want to evaluate a program that they're currently planning on implementing, but they don't have the resources to carry out the evaluation piece of it. So you are expected to develop a partnership with a research group, whoever that researcher is, whether it's out of a university or a nonprofit, and partner up with a state or local education agency and propose to evaluate that policy, right, given the most rigorous design that you can come up with. I hope you guys got the idea, right? It's a partnership. We offered for the first time in Fiscal 13 this new researcher practitioner partnership in education research. The purpose here is really, I think of it as my, our seed money grant. The idea here is let's create some of these partnerships modeled um, in, in part on things like the Chicago uh, Consortium for School Research where you want to bring together researchers with state and local education agencies, or I should say state and or local education agencies, in the development of joint research projects. So researchers often have research questions that they're really interested in, but they may not always be the same research questions that practitioners and policymakers have. And so the hope here is to create a space, if you will, and provide some fiscal support to allow folks to come up with research ideas together um, and essentially write a proposal together to come in under our uh, regular competitions, regular, our 305A competition. All right, here again, I want to just put out the fiscal amount so you all can see those. We're not expecting those to change. Um, uh, and certainly not expecting them to change in a positive direction, right, where we don't see them going up. If anything, they would go down. So this new competition that I keep talking about. <coughs> so we are, we're proposing this new competition. It will be a single RFA, like 305A, where there'll be different topics. And the new topic is this one called Continuous Improvement in Education Research. I really do want to reach out to folks and encourage you, if you've not looked at that RFA, uh, that new topic description, on continuous improvement in education research to do so. We're seeking comments and I've on the front page there I've got my little arrow that points to where the information is. The purpose here is really to support um, ways to figure out how to ensure that research interventions or, or developed interventions that are being developed are actually adapted in a, again an iterative process but to the the particular needs of a particular practice a particular group right a state or a district anyway what I'd encourage you to do is read that provide us with some feedback we're really working right now to try to think about the right way to frame that and to pull together the single RFA that encompasses the researcher practitioner um, uh, partnership grant state and local with this continuous improvement all right so please do give us feedback we're looking forward to it all right, so now that your faculty have decided to apply what's next, I'm going to try to highlight some of the procedural aspects of this. Um, and again, for those of you who've already heard this, I want to apologize ahead of time. Um, but repetition's good, right? Then you'll remember it. So if you have not worked with the Institute of Education Sciences in the past, I want to let you know that our program officers are actually encouraged and expected to work closely with applicants as they develop their applications. 
So unlike NSF and NIH who are often who often don't have sufficient time because of their project loads to work really super closely with all applicants, we really do. And we are um, we encourage our my staff to do that. I encourage my staff, as does my colleague in special ed. <coughs> Program officers are associated with competitions and or topics. Contact information is included at the end of each RFA and it's also available on the website. So if there's nothing you remember from today other than that, that's the thing I want everyone to take away. Please have them talk to us. <coughs> in terms of policies and procedures, I want to reiterate about the letter of intent. Letters of intent really are important, but they are not required. So often I do get folks who, who've missed the deadline by a day or two, and they say, oh my gosh, can we still submit a letter of intent? You can, actually. The letter of intent window is usually open for about a week after the deadline. So please do, uh, if, you, if you have a faculty member who's a little bit behind, tell them to send the letter of intent in. It's really important, it's really helpful for us. I mentioned the two reasons earlier. It helps us sort of begin that relationship with program officers if it hasn't already begun, and provide feedback. And it helps our review team make sure we've got the right reviewers on hand. Um, but it's not required. The other piece, and, and I know this is true across all of the presentations that are being offered through this wonderful series that, uh, that you all are listening to, is that we require electronic submission, right? So unless you have a real demonstrated need to use paper and pencil, Letters of intent should be submitted in electronic format. We have a page, this page right here is the page through which you will submit them. <coughs> Again, policy and procedure here. We do not accept late applications. All right, and I just want to reiterate this that late means, so it's 4.30 p.m. I don't have this on here. I'm sure that time is not going to change. It's 4.30 p.m. on the day that it's due. Um, and seconds matter, all right? So Computers, the great joy of computers is that they give you seconds. Um, some, I'm just trying to think of some other policy things you need to know about this. So the seconds that matter, the time that matters is not the time on your computer. It's the time on the grants.gov computer. So you really don't want to push it up to the very last minute. Um, the other thing, I'm trying to think with the, uh, sorry, I had another point and now it's totally gone out of my head. Um, <clears throat> The main thing is really that the seconds count. Oh, the, I know what the other thing is, is that in terms of we'll often get, people will ask us things like, well, I was having a problem uploading it and the system wouldn't let me upload it. You just need to know that oftentimes the problem is on the uploader end and it is, it is almost never at the grants.gov end. And the only way that we would accept a late application would be if there was a demonstrated problem on the grants.gov end of things. And in all of the time that I've been here, that's never happened. So now I will say, in a situation like what happened Monday and Tuesday, if there was a hurricane and the government was shut down and there were you know, things out of our control, then that would clearly have an implication for, for this. But, but in general, this doesn't ever happen. So the bottom line is submit early, um, submit in time that you can actually make sure that what you uploaded is correct. Okay, everything submitted through grants.gov. Again, you know, there is a procedure to follow that's published in the Federal Register if you are unable to use grants.gov, but uh, to my knowledge, that has not been a strategy that we have used um, in many, many years. So please use grants.gov. All of our packages will be up by mid-April. And this is a page that I'm sure many of you are very, very familiar with. All right, critical documents. Again, this is another thing that often will confuse people in terms of thinking about policies and procedures. I'll get requests from people who say, when is your application package going to be ready? I need it to start writing my application. No, actually you don't. The only thing you need to start writing your application is the request for applications. That will be available, like I said, uh, early March is our target and that's, you are usually pretty good at hitting that. But if you have people who are interested in pulling together an application right now, they can actually do that using the information in our requests for applications that are currently available. You can start writing our 25-page single-space narrative. You can start preparing your budget. You can begin to prepare your appendices. And then when the new RFAs are released in early March, you should go back and review that RFA and make sure there aren't any major changes. And I'm not anticipating any major changes for most of the RFAs. Um, 
then you'll be really ahead of the curve. You'll already have talked to the program officer. You'll already have received lots of feedback. And so you'll be in a position that when the application package is actually submitted, you'll be able to upload it on time or maybe even early, right? Okay, peer review process. Just wanted to lay this out um, that we follow a triage process. All of our applications are initially reviewed for compliance and responsiveness to the RFA. What does this mean? What this really means is that we are looking to make sure that all of the sections that are in the RFA are included in your project narrative. So for example, we require in, I'm just, I hesitated here, in I think almost all of our applications, but certainly in our major competitions, that there be information presented and sections presented in your 25 page single space narrative that reflect the significance of the project, the research plan or research methodology, personnel and resources. Do not leave out the sections on personnel and resources in your 25 page single space narrative. If you say, well, why should I include a personnel section? It's all in the CVs. That will, that will sync your application and it will be returned without review. So you want to make sure that you have everything that's required in the RFA. Please read the information in the RFA. Wherever we use the word must, it's a real must. Okay, so the word must say is a, something that triggers a requirement in terms of re re reviewing for compliance and responsiveness. So please make sure you read that carefully. That's the bottom line. All right, once applications have been determined to be both compliant and responsive, they are then assigned to a review panel. This is handled by our standards and review office and if you remember back to that very very first slide they are a separate office. The research centers are actually not part of this process. The standards and review office handles it. It's parallel to the NIH procedure if you're familiar with that. Um, they then assign those compliant and responsive applications to a review panel. Typically, two to three panel members conduct a primary review of every application that comes in and that meets that compliance and responsiveness criterion. Then there is a triage process where the highest scoring or the lowest scoring in the way that it works for us, but the most competitive applications are then reviewed by the full panel meeting. That and then the, what the percentages are or the numbers are of those really varies as a function of the quality of applications that come in. <coughs> Right? For the first time, and this actually just happened, um, lists of the names of individual research grant peer reviewers are now available online. What you will notice is that the Standards and Review Office has a list there of the fiscal 2012 peer reviewers. And what you'll notice there, the, the sort of content area that's there, those are the names of our standing panels. So we have standing panels of reviewers, and those standing panels are called to review twice a year, for most of them, not for all of them, um, and that those panels uh, can expand as a function of the number of applications that we receive. All right. The other important thing to know about the peer review process, and again I want to make sure everyone's familiar with this, is that while it's a standing panel, we actually have panel members who rotate on and off, right? So that the panel is typically stable over the course of a single fiscal year, right? So, so folks who are reviewing for um, the June and application submissions of 2012 are generally the same. There is actually um, there will be changes from year to year because people will rotate off their panels, right? They'll finish their three-year term and they'll move on. Or you could have someone who was called in as an ad hoc reviewer and who was used for a single year. But anyway, the reason I wanted to pull this out, draw this to your attention is that this is another question we often get, um, uh, is who are your reviewers? And you can look here to see who reviewed for us in fiscal 12. All right, I want to encourage everyone again to look at the resources for researchers page. This is a place where if you want to know like our most recent policies or procedures or things that are changing, you go to our resources for researchers page. We do try to keep that up to date. Um, it's a great place too for you to look for webinars where there's, we have information um, around uh, prior competitions or current competitions. So on the resources page, I'm going to highlight uh, two, two new policies that you may not be aware of, one around data sharing and one around public access to research. 
So I'll start with the, the last one first. So we now have a policy um, in reference to public access to research. As you may know, there's been a push across the federal government to encourage research funding organizations to try to make sure that all the research funded with public dollars is available to, um, to the world, right, to the, to the taxpayers. And so beginning in fiscal 2012, so this was during this year, the Institute of Education Sciences, or actually it was beginning for projects that were funded during fiscal 12, we require its, our grantees to submit their peer-reviewed research publications to the ERIC website, the Educational Resources Information Center. So I hope all of you all are familiar with ERIC. If you're not, I would encourage you to go back on there. Um, ERIC can be reached, it's eric.ed.gov. Um, and ERIC is, as you know, a place where lots of war research on education is stored, and we are now requiring our grantees to pull information there. Uh, th we have a policy, and you can read it in its entirety. Um, in order to make sure that we can get information up there as quickly as possible, we are encouraging um, all of our grantees to put, put the, final, the final accepted version of their papers up within 12 months of the publisher's official date of final publication. I know that people have different, we often get questions around, well, what about my publisher? And my publisher's got copyright. There is information on ERIC about that process, and your program officers, as well as the ERIC staff, will work with you to try to make sure that we meet everybody's requirements here. Um, and just so you know, what do we do with this? So the page that you have right here is a, a project that Laura Justice was the PI to. It was funded originally in 2007, I believe. And this is the list of publications that is included at the end of her project abstract. And one of the things that we have been doing is going through and actually hyperlinking the publications from the projects that are available in ERIC. Now, not all of them have full text yet, but this will at least get you to the citation. And through ERIC, it'll actually give you ways to get the full text if we don't have permission to upload that. So I just wanted you all to know that we are actually actively working with our grantees to make this happen. ERIC is actually working to make it really evident on the citation pages when things are funded by IES. So this is sort of a real, a real goal for us. So again, lots of information is available, so please do, do visit. A second policy that, that has happened that you may or may not be aware of is our policy in reference to data sharing. So beginning with the new awards, so the ones that, we are, what, that we've received all the applications for and that are currently in the process of decision making around, any researchers who applied for goal four scale-up evaluation grants except that now they're effectiveness grants, so I need to correct that on the slide and on our webpage, um, under competitions for either education research or special education research are expected to include data sharing plans in their applications. This is, um, the expectation for data sharing is something that we are currently working on. We're kind of taking uh, small initial steps to try to figure out all the rules around this. As you know, sharing data um, is something that the National Center for Education Statistics knows a lot about and does routinely. Um, but for researchers, it's a new, a new area and there's a lot of concerns around IRB regulations and trying to make sure that everything is well documented. So we are working hard to um, try to make this clear for researchers, but I want you to be aware of the fact that we are moving aggressively toward uh, making sure that information can be shared across projects. All right, I do want to just let you know in terms of some things that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, of course, you're familiar with reading the RFA, um, that we want you to call and reach out to program officers. I want to make sure here that I note that as time permits, IES program staff are available to review draft proposals and to provide feedback. Um, this is, again, different from other, or from other agencies, and so I just wanted to highlight that for you. Again, it's something that we really enjoy doing, and we really like working with you all to help you put in the best possible applications that you can. So do reach out to us, and we will help. In terms of our notification process, the current process is that applicants receive uh, email notification of the status of their application, and applicants receive copies of the reviewer comments via email. 
Um, we are actually actively working on an, audit, on an application notification system that will sort of parallel the processes that are in place both for NSF and for NIH where applicants will be able to go in and log in and get um, their reviews directly from uh, our peer review system that's in process. I can't give you anything more than that we're working on it. We're hoping it will be in place very soon, um, but I will certainly be sure to share that with you and we'll probably send out a news flash when we have that ready to go. Um, and the last thing that I want to just comment on here is that if you're not granted an award the very, very first time that you get it, and again, that doesn't happen. There are very few people who get awarded the first time through. Please do plan on resubmitting Know that your program officer is there to help um, and help you perhaps interpret reviewer comments, help you decide what are the most important and critical things for you to respond to. So please do reach out to your program officer. And I think, oh wait, got a couple of things here too for grantees. So since I'm supposed to talk about grants as well, I wanted to just put a few points in here. Uh, for those of you who are, not, are new to our system, we distribute funds to grantees through the G5 system. And so that's the website there, and there's a process, of course, if you get awarded, you get, um, you'll learn how to go through that system, but that's the system that we use. Um, our IES annual reports are also submitted through that G5 system. We, this past year, moved to using the Federal Research Performance Progress Report form for our grantees, again, submitted, up, uploaded through the G5 system. Um, this is really a great thing for us because in the past we were using the annual report form for the whole Department of Education and because the vast majority of department grants are actually for implementing programs, that's what they support as opposed to carrying out research, um, a lot of the categories didn't really make sense. But with the new RPPR format, it really helps us get um, research information uploaded, including lots of information about publications and project products. And I'm, I know that if the, for those of you who are going to be listening to other folks over the course of the next few days, that the RPPR format is being used across the government and there's this real push to trying to make sure that um, consistent information is being collected across the research agencies. Um, Grantees, if you receive a funding, you receive guidance from program officers about how to fill in uh, annual reports and how to use G5, and we hold, annuals to, uh, we hold webinars twice annually to describe the new format, right, to walk through the particular guidelines. I could have gone through that here, but I think that that's not necessary at this point. All right, so that was my last slide. So for more information, uh, please go to our website. The funding, slide, uh, the funding page will take you right there. If you just go to ies.ed.gov, I encourage you to look at the resources for researchers page. We are constantly trying to improve that and make sure that more information is up there. And as new policies and procedures are implemented, information will be included at that site. And uh, as always, please feel free to send me questions um, after, the, after the session if I don't get a chance to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Elbro. If you have a question that you'd like Dr. Elbro to answer, please submit it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Um, do have a few questions here already. Um, first one, um, you actually have somewhat addressed already. Um, an investigator was wondering um, how she can get reviewer comments or if they mm -hmm. need to request them. But you said a new system is going to be in place. Right. If, if people want to get that news blast, should, is, they should sign up on the website? They should sign up on the website for our news flash. Um, which I hope that everyone who's interested in IS funding already does. So that, if you go to our main page, um, and I didn't include that slide in this one, there is a, a link to the new, where it says news and events, and if you click on there, then you can get to the news flash. Um, if you applied this year and are, are currently being reviewed, all applicants this year will also receive an email blast that tells you how to get access to that if indeed it's implemented in time, right? So we're kind of in process. But in general, regardless of whether it's through email or through this new system, everyone who submitted uh, a, an application that was considered to be both responsive and compliant and that went forward to peer review has peer reviewer comments and those should be, will be sent to you. And, and if for whatever reason you don't get access to it, you should reach out to your program officer. I guess the only caveat to know is that the, the persons to whom that, the reviews are sent it would be the named principal investigator of the award as well as usually I believe the sponsored projects officer, whoever the authorized rep is also gets a copy of them.
Okay, good to know. Um, we have another question here. Uh, for a researcher who is not a new investigator, mm -hmm. but has research interest in the area of undergraduate student learning and special education, is the special education research program a viable option, or are there other programs or agencies that you would recommend um, for seeking support? You know what, that's actually a really, really good and important question. So for Underneath the National Center for Special Education Research, the only work that we support for that would be focused on the transition aspect of that. So we would need to work with students who are currently, students in special education who are currently in high school. If you're interested in looking at that transition all the way into post-secondary, right, not just what's happening at the high school level, but, but into the undergraduate levels, you actually would need to come in under our post-secondary and adult education topic um, underneath the National Center for the, what is it, Education Research Grants Program, the A4.305A. Um, because the Special Education Center is funded through IDEA funding, that funding only goes through grade 12, and so there are limits in terms of how they are allowed to spend their funds. But we do support it under the, the, regular, the regular ed competition. Okay, thank you. Sure. Again, any questions, feel free to email them to federalupdate at missouri.edu. Um, one question here, um, are there any samples of data sharing plans that researchers can see? That, you know, that's actually a really good question, and I don't believe that we have one up there, but if you go to our policy page, we have sort of laid out some, uh, some ideas about what should be included, and you know, there's a, a bulleted list of the kinds of information that needs to be there. This is new, we're learning as well as you all are, and uh, once we get good examples, I'll be sure to put them up there. So thanks, okay. great question. Thank you. Um, okay, this is, this is a fairly uh, common question, and we were talking about this during the break. Um, well, can you tell us a little bit more about the average funding rates? Uh, sure, the average funding rates um, for our competitions tend to run between 10 and 12 percent. Um, and that's really for our primary research competition. I actually don't have the rates for the other, the other competitions, but it's competitive. Um, we have been fortunate so far that all applications that have been considered to be outstanding or excellent have been able to receive funding, except in cases where the number of awards are limited. So I do want to put that clause in there. So for the A3 competition, there is a limit to the number of awards we'll be able to make. I believe the number there is three. Um, under Reading for Understanding, we had a limit in terms of the number of applications that we were going to be able to fund. So that just, just be aware that under some competitions, and like under the Early Career Award, there's a limit in terms of the number of awards that are, are going to be made. Okay. Um, this question is about the peer review process. Um, some agencies allow um, faculty members and researchers to sign up to become peer mm -hmm. reviewers. Um, is that something that you do? Um, how can qualified individuals sign up to be a reviewer? So yeah, we certainly would love to hear from folks who are interested in serving as reviewers. It's a great way to learn about our process, to learn the RFA, to sort of hear the kinds of questions that reviewers ask. Um, the easiest way to do that actually is probably to send it directly to me and then I will forward it to our Director of Standards and Review. Um, Anne Ricciuti is our Director of Standards and Review, but I can never spell her email and so if you send it to me, I can just forward it to her. <laughs> okay, again, if you have a question that you'd like Dr. Elbro to address, please send it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. This is a question that's related to the uh, researcher practitioner partners in education research. Mm -hmm. um, are there any policies that would it, um, impede having a research collaboration with a for-profit education provider? Or is it strictly for the state and local education groups? So, you know, that's actually a really good question. And I think, I mean, and I'm going to have to defer and say we'd have to go back and look at the RFA. I don't actually know sort of all the ins and outs of that RFA as well as perhaps I should. It is my understanding that at this point it was really focused on state and local states and, and LEAs. Um, there was a restriction in there where it was only one, um, one application per district or state, right, because in terms of trying to limit that. And, and clearly any thoughts that you all have about, about things that would be good to have or good to include are really welcome at this point as we're really thinking about how to build uh, the sort of research capacity, if you will, and research effort in the um, in the policy uh, policymaker practitioner space. Okay. Any more questions for Dr. Elbro? Um, please send it to federalupdate at missouri.edu. 
Um, if for some reason you have a question that comes up later, you can feel free to send it either to federalupdate at missouri.edu and we'll get it to Dr. Elbro, or you can get it to Dr. Elbro directly. Her email is at the end of her uh, slide presentation. Um, and at this time, I'm just going to say thank you, Dr. Elbro. We appreciate it. And uh, coming up at the top of the hour, we're going to have a presentation um, from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great one.